Yes. So we've got to get to module three. Module three is the practicum. It's where we start literally going into our Bibles, getting, starting to learn how to give the Bible studies. We're just going to spend a few weeks on that because we have a Bible worker. We have literature evangelists coming. We have a whole team of people coming to help us in um, June or the end of June, maybe 1st of July. But I want to be ready for that group because when the Bible study request um, some of you are going to be the hardcore knocking on door people, but I'm assuming that most of y'all probably are not going to do that. I hope you do, but if you don't, I think that what most people do is they're like, yeah, give me a Bible study, I'll go follow up on it. And we're, it's potentially possible we're going to have hundreds of those requests. So we've got to be ready. And I don't want this to be just a seminar where we learn a bunch of stuff and then we all go back to the same thing. I just, I don't ever want to do that. I don't want, at least... My time here, Conroe, is going to be this kind of church where we're reaching the lost. And when I mean the lost, I mean our loved ones, and then our friends, and then the strangers. So this card is very important, super, super important, because I want you to put, it would be best if you could put five names, but if you can only think of one name, at least one name, and it can't be the same as your spouse, of somebody that you are going to be specifically praying for, that is in your mind to give Bible studies to so that when that time comes, that heart will be open. And then when you get done with the cards, I want you to tonight just bring them and put them up here somewhere. And that is going to be something that we pray over during the week. And then when we get together with each other, we're going to be praying over those names that God soften their hearts. So um, if you can't think of a particular name, if it's a stranger, just put coworker. There's a coworker in my mind, or something to that effect. Someone that you are gonna, that you, that you are thinking God is gonna put the courage in your heart to reach out to, and ask, "Hey, I got some Bible studies. Would you like to study?" Just uh, 30 seconds of courage could it could turn someone's entire life around. So that's what I want y'all to think about. You don't have to do it now, but before the day is over, please put them up here because I'm gonna be having people to pray and fast over these names. So the prayer team, when I've said that this afternoon, I meant it, everyone has a work to do. So there's some people that are on a prayer team that's all they want to do is pray. Well, this list of names is going to that prayer team for you to soften that heart. Um, let me give these... Okay, our security officer is headed out that way. Um, so, and I want to also explain something to y'all while I'm walking around here. Yeah, no, y'all's names don't need to be on there. Just put the person that you, that you want to have prayed for for the intention of receiving Bible studies. So whoever it is, make it, make it crazy. I don't know, somebody that you just would think would never do it and see what prayer can do. Okay, so I wanted to cover that with you on these cards. Um, I'm not sure our binder is going to hold everything. So you might have to get another binder for this section. And the reason why I went through the, through the cost and the time of printing these off because I want you to have this particular, this particular document that we're going over is a compilation that was put out by the White Estates in 1969, and it, it, what it does is it's, it's bringing together the center themes of what it takes to explain to someone what it means to be an Adventist in light of the sanctuary of the judgment. And so it's not going to get detailed in a bunch of places. It's overall broad themes to give you enough information that you can sit down and say, this is why you need to be a Seventh-day Adventist, because this message is a message from God, and there is no other message, and here's how we can prove it. When you can do that, you've got a mighty weapon in your, in your control. So that is the design of the book. The way that I, I, re, I put it in here for you, if you recognize the underlined sections correlate to the red questions. So the first underlined section is where you're going to be able to find the answer to the red question. And, you know, some of these things, you, they're not going to be... Direct, direct, direct answers. You can, just as long as you get the idea. And so we're going to try to get through this as quick as we can. I don't really know how long this is going to take. This is an experiment. But I, ha I figured that I have a month to do this whole book. 
It's got eight chapters. We do two today, two next week, two the week after, then two in the final week. And in that, you're going to have everything you need to know written down so you can review. And then I'm going to have a set of follow-up Bible studies that you can share with on the sanctuary, just like you're going to have the follow-up Bible studies on the gospel. So you'll be armed with what we're going to look at on the board, both aspects. So, but before I, I, we start, I've got to ask y'all, because I told you this morning about me flying out to Yakima to do an 11-day series. That means I'm gone next Sabbath and the Sabbath after. It would kill me if we missed the training seminar for two weeks. We, I mean, we could swing one week maybe, but two weeks would be detrimental, and even one week would put me behind. So the, here's the question. Do y'all want to, because I have to fly out Friday morning, and so Wednesday night is the only time that I could study. Do y'all want to come here Wednesday night at, like, the prayer meeting time at 7 o'clock and go over the next section? And if you can't make it, it's recorded, and you have to watch it. Before. You cannot miss nothing from now on. I mean, absolutely, if you miss anything, you're going to get lost. And if you've been lost within the Adventist message of what all this stuff means, you this is a chance to get it cleared up and to finally understand why you believe in this Advent message, much more than just the Sabbath, right? I mean, I'm an Adventist not because of the Sabbath. It's part of the reason why I'm an Adventist. I'm an Adventist for what I'm fixing to show you on this board. And so, so if y'all want to meet again Wednesday, it's a lot of work on this next section to do in three days. So that means tomorrow you're going to have to get on your homework and start going through this stuff and asking questions. And if there's something you don't understand, class time is where you're going to be able to say, hey, I'm, not, I'm unclear on this. And this is where we're going to be able to ask questions and learn. And, I'm, and some of it we're going to try to jet through as quick as we can. So, okay, so we're going to meet Wednesday. So if you're watching online, this is we're going to meet back at Wednesday at 7 o'clock and... If you do not have module two yet, and I, it should be posted really soon within the next day or two, but if not, email me and I'll send you the rough draft of it so you, at least you'll have it. So tonight, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at, and the whole book of Christ in His Sanctuary is designed to teach the Advent message, and this is the Seventh-day Adventist paradigm, the message. We have two center themes. We have the judgment hour of God and the everlasting gospel, right? Those are the two defining themes to Adventism. So the judgment hour is defined by our two texts that we are most noted for. Daniel 8, 14, for unto 2,300 years then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, or as you will learn, the judgment begins. And then the New Testament counterpart to that is fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So that hour of judgment in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is what comprises the idea of the judgment hour. Adventists were raised up in this world to tell the world that the judgment hour has begun. And everything else that flows out of that is part of that message. But the second theme to be in an Adventist, which if you didn't have this, to know the judgment would mean nothing. It would just mean you're condemned and you're dead meat. The second theme to Adventism is the everlasting gospel. Revelation 14, 6. For I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The three angels' message begins with a, with a call to the everlasting gospel. So that's why I took y'all through, if you remember, I took you through the wheel of faith, through the gospel. Because that particular, and that includes how the law works together with the gospel. That's that whole idea that is what the everlasting gospel is about. The everlasting gospel, in light of everything that we said about it for the past two months, is how you survive the judgment. And so the Adventist message is to call people to the gospel because the judgment of God has begun. And that's a full understanding of the, of the gospel, not a half-baked gospel. Not just justification, but justification, sanctification in relationship to the law and the Sabbath. An understanding of that gospel is how we prepared for the judgment. That's our message, and it's summed up in the Adventist battle cry. This is our mission statement, 
right? The two-phase ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. That statement comprises everything we just said. And so the book that we're studying is going to just bring out the highlights of what it takes to be able to explain this to others. And so you're going to have your own paperwork, and then you're going to have a set of more simplified Bible studies to share with someone in the very near future. So that's what we're doing tonight. And so that is the themes of the module two right there. Everything that we talk about is going to flow out of this idea. And so I pray that you grasp it, because you're finally going to have something to share with family that I think is the most amazing thing in the world, is to be able to share the idea of this message with people, and that they know that we have got something, that God has raised up a group of people to share this with the world. So that is where we're going, Christ in His Sanctuary, Module 2. Let's get right into it. So lesson one. So lesson one is going to deal with our message. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Adventist history, how we was, you know, how the Advent message came about, where it came from. And then there's going to be theology about that message. So there's got all it's got a little mixture of theology of, of the three angels message, the judgment, the sanctuary and Adventist history. You know, it's in Adventist history is not Adventist history. It's world history. It's what was happening at the end of the Second Great Awakening. All right, the Second Great Awakening was God awakening the world and he ended it on this note right here. That's powerful. If you study the First Great Awakening, in the 1700s, you get into the Second Great Awakening. That's in the uh, mid 1800s when you had all the great reform movements going on the abolitionist movement, the child labor movement, the Bible tract society, the missionary societies, the prison reform. Uh, you had the Salvation Army. You had all these great, powerful movements. That's why they called it the Second Great Awakening. And the, the powerful preaching of the millennium. And then comes William Miller with this message right here. Well, after Miller, this is the message that developed at the end of the Second Great Awakening. And it was God's method of preparing the world. So the Advent history is not just for Seventh-day Adventists. It is actually literally the history of Christianity brought to its culmination. And no one else has that claim. And we don't say that proudful, but we're saying it to people. You need to take another look at what we're talking about. And so I'm praying and I'm hoping that Adventists will talk more about this than just focusing on one aspect of what we believe. Because this is what's going to bring people into, into the truth. And the Sabbath is illuminated through this. The law is illuminated through this. Christ in his righteousness is illuminated through this. So that's where we're going to go. So um, we're going to get right into the centrality of our message. So I'm going to start with the red questions. And then we can answer them. And I got some talking points. If you have anything on any one of these questions that you need clarified or you want to make a comment about, we'll do like we've been doing. And we'll just start talking because I'm assuming... If you didn't, it's not going to work. You have to have had gone through the lesson. That way, half of it is out of the way in your mind. Oh, I already got that. I understand that. There's no big deal with that. And the parts that we need to hone in on, that's what our time together is going to be. If you don't do the homework, it's going to be impossible to keep up, I promise you, because we're going to be flying through this stuff. Um, okay, so question number one, the first red question I have there is, what is the danger of interpreting biblical truths outside the sanctuary message. What did y'all get from that? Is there any danger in, in that? What was some of the answers? We probably should get a... Yes. No present truth. There's the one I'm looking for. Erroneous theories engross the mind, sidetracks people, so any message outside of the message, this is going to be important because we have well-intentioned people even among us and well-intentioned Seventh-day Adventists. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring the church alive. They're desperately trying to reach the young people, and I sympathize with that. They're desperately trying to reach people that don't come to church no more. I understand that, but they're going about it in the wrong way, and I think they're doing that because they don't understand they haven't been taught. And right off the bat, the compilation is taking us right to the, to the crux of the problem. When we, when we move off of the message that God gave to the world at the end of the Second Great Awakening, we get into all kind of weeds 
hedgerows, side theories, weird stuff. I mean, I'm studying with a couple now that's all into keeping the feast days literally. And that, that has morphed into another weird theology and another weird theology, and pretty soon they, they just, they're just all over the place. And so the sanctuary keeps us anchored in what God wants us to know and nothing else outside of that because we're fallen, our minds are scattered, we're all over the place. He says, this is what you need to know. At the end of time, post-1844, this is the message. There's nothing else that matters at this point. And that is what we're here to do, and I hope that y'all start to learn it from that point of view. So what is the, what is the message that's the foundation of our faith? The second question there. Yes, the sanctuary message is the foundation of our faith. And nothing else is the foundation of our faith, right? The next question is, do you see any current trends in the Adventist church that undermines that above statement? <laughs> You've got to be blind. I love my church, don't get me wrong. And I'm careful not to be too critical to her. But I'm telling you, the church is filled with not the church in its not the church in proper, but ministers, people coming along, youth pastors, people trying to shake it up and make it a little different, inadvertently, not knowing it, are undermining the very foundation of our faith. Because the very foundation of our faith is what's on this board right here. And if you're preaching something else, no matter even how biblical it is, right? If you're preaching something else, you are taking the church away from her message and mission and understanding. The present truth, and that is a huge theme. Present truth means at this time, currently, there's other truths out there in the Bible. Sure, we could talk about the, the, the parables of Jesus all day long. We could spend a whole year just going through the Psalms together. We could spend months and months just looking at the Old Testament stories. And those are truths, but they're not present truth. Present truth is to start expounding this in all of its beauty and ways. And that is what the church in some places are failing. Some pastors are failing to be able to do this. And it's, it's undermining our foundation, which is this is our foundation. So there's all kind of movements out there. I, I've, I've got some ideas, but I don't really want to get into those particularly. So we're just going to Leave it at that, because this is how the book begins, giving us the foundation of our faith. Now, so now we start going into a description of the 2300 days. It's in here. And what I wanted to do is, is move on to the next area. The way I've got it designed is to go to the next set of red questions. Do you see the question that says, what was the early Adventist understanding of the importance of sharing the sanctuary message? Page five, there you go, because mine's going to be a little different than y'all's. But I, I want to bring up something. There are some names. This is one of my pet peeves, and if, if you're guilty of this, just forgive me, I didn't know it. Really. But it, it just bothers me somewhat when I hear people quoting Andrew Murray or A.W. Tozier these guys that were around the end of the Second Great Awakening or the generation after it, there are some names in Seventh-day Adventism that was in this next section that we should absolutely know. Our children should know. We as Adventists should know the name of Hiram Edson. I mean, he's like foundational, not Ellen White. Hiram Edson is foundational to understanding the sanctuary. And his two associates, Crozier and Hahn, right? O.L. Crozier and F.B. Hahn, along with Hiram Edson, if you looked in your section, these two men, when the great disappointment of 1844 happened, they was trying to figure out what in the world just went on. And they went and they prayed and they prayed and they opened their Bible and they kept looking and looking and studying and praying and praying and praying into the night. And the next day, God revealed to Hiram Edson what had actually just taken place in 1844. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's 
They were weeping. They were weeping not because they were wrong. They were weeping because they're not going to be with Jesus. That revealed their heart. And God came to that kind of people that was willing to sell off their tractors, their farms, their lands, their crops, willing to sell it all off because ain't nothing mattered but being with Christ. And God came to that people and revealed to them the sanctuary message. So Crozier, Hahn, Hiram Edson, Joseph Bates, Ellen White, James White, Father Pierce, as he was called, he was the old man. Does someone else have something? Go ahead. Ellen White was, she said that the Lord didn't give her beforehand what was correct. He only gave her afterwards that it was correct when they came upon a, on points that were uh, to be dwelt upon. Sure. And it was the others that you mentioned, Hiram Edson and the rest of them, that were hashing this out. And it was, it was interesting that the Lord only confirmed that they were correct, not to give them a direction to go. Right, and I find it interesting, you bring up a good point, it just sparked a thought in my mind, that they had to learn this stuff, like, with no technology, their Bible's in a concordance. And they sat up all night long and study for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I find it interesting, at the end of time, God's people are gonna have to relearn we're going to have to relearn, and God is going to bring us back to this understanding of this beautiful message that we've got. And so, so the question is, what was the early Adventist understanding of the importance of sharing the sanctuary message? It's essential, but did you catch the idea that they said that there was this essence of humility that... We can't believe that God has entrusted such a beautiful message to us. That was their ideology. I can't, but we can't believe that God would choose us at the end of time to bring to the world such a beautiful and full and enlightening picture of the gospel. They couldn't understand it, but they, they ran with it. So even after the disappointment, they didn't go back to their fields and farms and tractors and houses and lands, did they? They, once they got an understanding, oh, so it's the time of the end. Well, that's even more important. Thank God he gave us a break. He gave us a little opportunity because the, a lot of those people were weeping over their loved ones. If you story the story of Joseph Bates and his wife, they wept over their son because he was lost. And what a relief that Christ, in a sense, didn't come back. But they took that time, therefore, from then till the end of their life that we're in the judgment hour and we need to be out preaching. And they, buddy, they went out and preached until they went to their graves broke and poor. And here we are at the end of time, and I really believe God is calling us to do the same thing. Amen. It's time to become broke and poor and spend time in this. And that's why we're bringing this to you. So it was difficult for them to believe that God gave it. So what was the truth that was basic to the whole structure of Adventism? Again, we're going to keep going over the same idea. Sanctuary. The sanctuary message. So I wonder if we traveled around the church today. Again, I'm not being pejorative to my denomination. I'm going to blame this on the pastors. If you was to travel around Adventism today, around the division, and just listen to all the different messages, do you think you'd become away if you knew nothing about religion that... Oh, they believe in the sanctuary. Do they believe in Jesus is coming through the 2300 years? Do you think that they would even know what we're talking about? No. No. They, there would be no understanding of this. And that is a shame because this needs to be the broken record. Yeah. Not the parsley on the plate. It's the main course. I never knew there was such a thing as present truth. I've just learned of that recently. I'd never heard of that in church growing up or even in my earlier years as an adult. Right, and it's important because present truth, the term validates everything before it. It's saying, hey, you, you Baptists and all you evangelicals and everyone that came before 1844, you're valid. You served your purpose. You was doing the work that God gave you to do while Christ was in the holy place. Now let's follow him into the most holy place. Go ahead. I'm a product of Adventist education, and uh, that's, that's where I picked it up in Adventist education along the way, coming up, be, besides the evangelistic series that used to be held 
you know, every year in a church. No, and, and that's, that, Doug, you, and uh, Amber, and a few others of our teachers are here. But shouldn't Adventist education be rooted in this stuff? Shouldn't our kids graduate from our schools like dyed in the wool with this? We'll just leave that out to you. Um, but I appreciate my teachers being here. Because it shows me that they're taking our message serious and they're willing to work with this church. As we work with the school, you work with us, and we're going to have a, a, a literate ceremony of graduation. When kids come out of here, they're going to be literate in this. I got together with this lady here back in 73. We were doing the timeline and all this other stuff that was going with it. The three angels message. So that's how we are here. I can't even spell Sabbath today. Yes, so I want to look at this word right quick. Did y'all get the section on this? The Sabbath in, in light of what? <laughs> it's powerful, right? Why was it? Do you remember why the Sabbath is so powerful in light of the sanctuary? What was, what was why, how did they understand the Sabbath in light now of the sanctuary message? Because of the, of the most holy place, right? Because of the Ark of the Covenant, which enshrined the law of God, which was the duty of man, it's what, it's what called man to accountability before God, and within the heart of that Decalogue was the Sabbath commandment. And they saw the Sabbath in richer and fuller ways now. And it was interesting, if you read, that was really at the heart of the rejection of the 1844 message. The evangelical churches rejected the message of 1844, the 23 years, because they didn't want to keep the Sabbath. They rejected the law, and therefore when you reject the law, you reject the whole point of the judgment, is there's a law there calling you to repentance. And you have a righteousness there in the high priest that will impute to you if you repent, but if you hold on to error like Sunday sacredness, well, you're in trouble. The, the system doesn't work that way. And so it was interesting how, how, they, how the Sabbath even had this beautiful illumination through that. So um, let's just continue. If y'all don't, don't stop, if y'all don't got something, I'm going to keep trying to roll through these pages because we got a lot to get through. So I, I, what I'm going to do is just flip to the next set of questions because that will bring, bring us to the end of the next section. So, so far, all we're doing is going over the history of this message, right? So question is, what dangerous philosophy was an attack on the sanctuary during the same... So, so during the 1870s and 1880s, the sanctuary message in the Adventist church had been established for 40 years by now. Then there was a dangerous attack that came upon the sanctuary message. What was it? That's good. There is no sanctuary? Why was they saying there is no sanctuary? Why was, who was it saying there is no sanctuary? Do y'all remember some of the names we talked about in there? What was one of the things that um, the book says was a, an attack itself? Something that Kellogg got into. Pantheism. Pantheism was, a, was the first attack against the sanctuary because it said, what did it say? Remember the book that Kellogg wrote called The Living Temple? You are the temple of God. There's no sanctuary in heaven. God's not constricted by some room and compartments. You're the temple. The reality is in you, not in some heavenly sanctuary. And that teaching, Ellen White saw it for what it was. It was a direct attack on the sanctuary. You knock out the sanctuary and you knock out Adventism. So this is what Desmond Ford was up to in the 70s. It wasn't just that, oh, there's no sanctuary. If you throw away the sanctuary and the church accepts it, then the Adventist message is gone completely. And so when I hear messages from places like Come and Let Us Reason that say we're the sanctuary, which there's truth in that in a sense that we're the temple of God, but not the sanctuary of God. 
When I hear people say that, 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 they're, that the temple in heaven is not a big deal to think about, and we're the temple that we need to talk about, whoo, that man needs to be fired. Because everyone's amen and how great he is and how wonderful. Sabbath school lesson is so beautiful. We're the temple. No, we're not. And if you accept that, you will reject that one. And if you reject that one, you're, you're throwing Adventism out the door. And that is the kind of dangerous philosophies that creep in because we don't know our message. If we knew our message, the moment that someone said something like that, the half the church would stand up and say, oh, excuse me? What are you talking about? Of course there's a sanctuary in heaven. Of course the reality, the objective reality needs to be upward in there, not downward in us. So I completely reject these ideas. And so the whole idea of the New Age movement within the Christian church that people are falling into left and right is the idea that, that we are the, it's like everything's about what God does within me. We're the temple, God dwells in me, and there's truth in that, don't get me wrong. But when you make that you the temple, and that's what's happening everywhere, it is nothing more than the living temple coming back in a different package. It's pantheism coming back. Because in the end, you really are divine. You and God, there's really almost no difference because he's dwelling in you and you're in him and he's in you. And there's this mystical weird. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, someone asked if you could answer the questions on page five. Page five. The bottom two. Which were? Let's see. Okay, so let's answer the. I think he answered that. And what contacts? Okay, in what context is the Sabbath to be understood? It's in the sanctuary. Why do you first yeah, the, the most holy place. That's right. And the second question I struck because it's redundant. How did you first learn about the Sabbath? And that was really a talking point. That wasn't meant to be a question. So, so the Sabbath is to be understood primarily in light of the sanctuary. And then it has great power to it. So... So what teaching should we ever keep before our minds? This, he says, the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. So from the moment that you approach the courtyard in the Old Testament and you see the screen, you'll be able you're to start to tabulate. And that screen means something. The veil means something. The, the place where the animals were tied up meant something. The altar meant something. The golden sockets meant something. Everything means something in that sanctuary. Because it's all designed to teach us about the judgment hour message. Everything. And so we should be paying um, close attention to that. Pastor? Yes. I just wanted to make one remark. I have friends in the Adventist church that believe there's going to be another temple built in Jerusalem. Another what? A temple built in Jerusalem. And that's in our faith. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I that's... Yeah. They, they grab that out of Ezekiel, right? The third temple. And it's clearly... When you read that temple, that's the... That is the sanctuary in heaven that Ezekiel's talking about. But that's, this is the erroneous stuff that's coming within the church because we don't know our message. And I'm going to be kind to people and say, well, they just don't know. So, but it's time to learn. Go ahead, Tim. Comes out of uh, uh, rapture theology. Dispensationalism, yes. Schofield and... Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. And it's, it's funny that we're falling into all of this stuff. But so, and, and she says that, that men will arise claiming to have new light, new light, new light. Remember that in the section? That they'll have new philosophies. They'll have these great new things and theories and ways of understanding stuff. They'll have all these new paradigms, this really cool way of looking at the gospel. And it's so exciting and exhilarating and fun. Be very, 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 very careful. When someone has a new understanding, I'm like, red flags are going up. So, Pastor, where, where exactly is the center in heaven? Is it in the throne room, or is it some, some building off to the corner? What is it? Well, I've never been there. And all that I know is that the one on earth was a pattern. So, whatever God means by that. So, is it... He also gave patterns for the candles, but there's no candle in heaven, I don't think. No candle? <laughs> but, well, in, 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 in when he was talking about the, the designs. Oh, yeah, they're representations. Maybe they're something. representations of work or phases of the work. 
Yeah. Is there literally a building that Jesus is standing in? Or, I it, personally don't think so. I think because the scripture always talk about the throne room of God. It doesn't talk about anything else. Well, sure, the throne room would be the sanctuary, would be the plant where the plan of salvation is worked out. And I, and I don't want to get too hung up and too hokey saying there's a literal building with literal walls. And he, I think the idea that the pattern is showing us is the phases of the work of Christ and the plan of salvation. So, and there, so I mean, I, I don't... It's, it says in John that when he get, was given the vision, he looked into heaven and he saw the, the candlestick in heaven and an angel with an with a incense burner before him. Scott, good, no good points, good points. Yeah, let's go ahead and we'll, and we, we can, we'll stay on this for a little bit and then get off of it because. A com comment on that also, and, and in addition, Ellen White was taken in vision into the sanctuary and saw physical elements of it. And then in another vision, she saw it from outside. So there's, there does seem to be some kind of reference to a location. Just okay, there you go. So this is why we're all here together. There's things that... We talk about the sanctuary that Moses was given the instructions to build as the miniature. So I think that as we think about the heavenly, we have to see it in a more grand uh, scale. It's not a little building. It's a, it is the very courts of, of uh, the palaces of heaven. Now, I like this. The, I, I like that idea. Okay. Can we really describe heaven? <laughs> if the Lord is showing you something, he's going to show you to what you understand. Human. When he created this earth, he created it as a garden. He didn't create buildings. Buildings are a result of sin. Compartments. He created a garden. It was open. Heaven, when you talk about heaven, you don't, you don't hear about compartments. You hear about the throne room. That's all you hear about. But I'll leave it alone. No, no, no. Hey, look, we're going to have different opinions sometimes on some of this. So that's okay. Because I don't want to get hung up on ethereal or literal or the point is the work that's being done there. So I tend to believe, um, yes, in, I mean, all I have is literal language to go by. So, but go ahead. And then we got a few more. Okay. When we, when we, I also just comment, you know, about scale. Um, your comment on scale, I think that's actually really true because if, if you think back to Daniel and when he saw Christ coming with the angels, he was traveling from the holy to the most holy to be the, and when the Ancient of Days was being seated. So there must have been quite some scale. So I'm just, I mean, I, don't, I wasn't trying to limit it to, to scale, but there, there appears to be scale that's beyond what we can comprehend. <laughs> And I think so, and, I, and I, I like what Brother Hess brought up. The scale has got to be a... I, I mean, I also, just because it's heaven doesn't mean that there's, there's not form and structure. One, one thing that I want to bring up is the fact that they had the plan of salvation way before there was sin. They had it already planned. Who knows? They don't go by years, but it had always been planned. So I believe the tabernacle was there in heaven. The sanctuary was in heaven preparatory to somebody sinning. I think it's always been there. And they always had this plan. I think it was from the very beginning. So that's my opinion. Amen. All right. This is where God resides, in the, in the sanctuary. We as human beings have shrunk considerably. It's estimated that Adam was over 18 feet tall. So in the scale of things, we don't have any idea. Yeah, and so all we got is this image that he's painted for us in the Bible, and apparently he was okay with us imagining that to understand things that Paul says you can't understand. So we'll leave it at that. One more comment, and we've got to move on. Go ahead. See, in my mind, the ark is a representation of God's throne. You have the law inside the ark, but the covering is called the mercy seat. That's God's mercy overshadowing the law. 
given us a way out. Oh, nice. Very nice. All these are nice ideas because the main point's coming. So if you, if you follow me, we're on what particular truth will come under the attack in the last days. Then let's go down to the next red question. Right? What teaching are God's people to focus on? What does she say? Do not rest until you become intelligent. Have your eyes fixed. Not an occasional glance. You know what that means? Don't study the sanctuary every now and then when uh, Oklahoma Academy comes down and does a little thing on what everything meant and then go, well, we did a sanctuary series. Those days have got to end. So that's the occasional glance. The real message is to intently look at it with what Richard's saying, with what Scott's saying, with what Charlie's saying. Let's explore those things. Let's get together. Let's study. Let's talk. And we're, we're all going to deepen one another. So the next question down, the next red question, we're under lesson two, the heavenly sanctuary in miniature, because here's what we're really driving to. The, the first question under that section, what does it say? What's the question? No, no. Keep. What was the sanctuary that Moses built Yes, what did it represent? Yes, so whatever... Y'all, page 13. I'm flying through, so I need to slow down a little bit. So we're just establishing in this first lesson, really lesson, let me see, that was lesson one, or chapter one. No, that's lesson one. Okay, now we're in chapter one. We finished... We finished the introduction, basically, to the book. And we just seen at the end of the introduction, the summary simple is this, right? How would you summarize chapter one? What was the overall message? The introduction. How would you, how would you summarize chap the introduction? Lydia? Wait. The heavenly sanctuary is important to study. Important to study? What were some other words you would say? I would use a little more stronger language. Fundamental to our belief. Critical. F critical, fundamental to our beliefs, important. Paramount. Central, to the ex central to our salvation. Central to our, oh, absolutely. People get nervous with that. But absolutely true, especially at the end of time when God is going to unveil a law in a guilty world that does not understand how this whole thing works, including the Sabbath involved in all of this. This is very important. This message is foundational to the exclusion of all other messages, which is unpopular to say in Adventism right now. Because we just have people that don't know. We're going to change that. <laughs> 